Pickaxe. Hello and welcome back to the Review of Death, a Doctor Who podcast, your fortnightly home for Doctor Who news and reviews. I'm Matthew Toffolo, I'm joined as ever by Billy Garrett John. Hello. And today we're talking about the Dalek Invasion of Earth, which is out now on Blu-ray on the Season 2 sets. We have it right here! <sighs> no we don't, because Amazon didn't deliver our ones, bastards. I so... have known for a while it was going to arrive on the 10th of December. So even <laughs> by the time this episode comes out, I won't have it in my possession. Uh, well, yeah, mine said the 12th, yeah. and it's been like that for ages, and I thought, oh, but they do that sometimes. And, and it'll come day. back. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, it's it been dispatched. Happen. I've been told it's been dispatched. But oh, really? But it, it won't arrive at Apparently until the 10th. Well, Jonathan's is coming tomorrow. Okay, so, so you can just... So I can play with it tomorrow. Enjoy his. Yeah. Excellent. This is all sounding a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, we can, we can watch it tomorrow. But sadly, we cannot go... Ooh, no, uh, but camera. I'm very much looking forward to it coming out. It's the first black and white series we've yeah. had. Um, and there's a great documentary on it that a very handsome man worked on. Um, called... Chris Chapman. Yes, yes, yeah. that, that handsome man. <laughs> uh, called Looking for David, which you should all watch because it's brilliant. Um, and all sorts of other things like Doctor Who and the Collectors. Yeah. Which she wasn't invited to be on. Well, it was. Uh, it is all about 60s memorabilia. Mm. And the only bit of Doctor Who memorabilia from the 60s that I own is the first annual. Have you got the first annual? Yeah, it was my Somebody uncle's. Somebody on the Review of Death Discord got the first annual in a charity shop. For 20 quid. <laughs> for 20 quid. That's really got to be a ridiculously good really price good. for that. But the one that you really want to get hold of, I don't have any John Pertwee annuals, mm. but the one that is really sought after is the pink John Pertwee annual. Mm. I think that's his first one. Okay. And I think there was some weird thing where not many were printed. Right. So it is like gold dust. Wow. So that's the one you want to get. Well, because I'm moving to New Zealand in the year, I've got a, a job lot of target books to get rid of. Oh, so yeah. I'll have to scour yeah. the archives and see which ones are more affordable and then bin the rest of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we have got something physical yes. in our possession. Yeah. And when Matt took it out of the box, I have to say, I thought, bloody hell, we're a lucky bunch of bastards. Yeah. Because, I mean, the new series logo adorns it. Yeah. Uh, including the ugly, um, uh, straight version of the logo. Yeah. D I mean... It doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. Don't you think? I don't think it works. Doctor Who! Because, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> whoa! Uh, it's just weirdly weighted, I think. I think the trouble is, this logo is never going to work. No. Long ways. No. Um, and I think a lot of the logos don't work long ways, unless they've been designed to be that way. Like exactly. The, like the Whitaker logo or the taxi driver logo. So why not just squeeze the diamond into a taxi shape and put it behind that? I don't know. I'm yeah, just, it's I'm hard, desperately isn't it? trying to make it because, work, but I just don't think because it does. If you, I mean, at least for this anyway, mm. if you put the diamond logo on the top, like a VHS. Yeah, it's too small. It's too small and then you, what, what do you put here? Well, unless you just put Doctor Who regeneration, which set, is hilarious know. though, because that it, when they were given that, I'm sure they went, well, it works on a social media profile picture, yeah, yeah. so it's perfect. Yeah. But then they went, no, we have to have it in that format as well. Yeah. And then they went, it doesn't work, but we like it too much like that. Yeah. That's kind of what I think's happened. Yeah. I mean, uh, the thing is, this is it's a lovely piece of packaging. Mm. Um, obviously, I will do a full review properly um, on the channel, but. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing da, how this... Da da da. Da da da. Da 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 da. da. Hello and welcome back to another <laughs> Doctor Who action figure review. Today I'm talking about the regeneration set. All right, um, don't bloody go on about it. So, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing how this works on, on the packaging, on the packaging itself. itself normally. And I mean, when you open it up and you see the goodies mm. inside, I mean, it's lovely. I love how they've used the elements of the logo to frame the box. So you've got the corner bits. It's really clever. I can see how it's going to get used in like a blister pack. Setting. Yeah. I can see that sort of in the corner and it's um, going to be in like a raised thing and yeah. it's, oh, it's going to look so good. Yeah, it's going to be really good. Um, yeah, so they're, they're really nice figures. Do you want to, shall I pull them out and have a look? Pull them out, pull them out and, and whack them on the table. Why not? Um, so I, from what I can see from the promo pictures, people were saying David Tennant has a massive forehead. I, I think the problem is, Yeah. Obviously, he's got a new hair sculpt. And actually looking at it in person, I think it's because the swoop maybe doesn't come down over his head enough. It right. kind of juts out at like a 90 degree angle rather yeah. than coming down over his head. But I think that might be what... Because from, from this angle, it looks fine, but straight on, 
Do you see what I mean? I can see what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, maybe it is slightly... I mean, the thing is... It, it looks a bit quiffier yeah, than, it does, he, than he does in real life with that haircut. But, I mean, if you look at the box, he's mm. got... You can see the... Yeah, the quiff is quiffy. But, um, I mean, these are all scanned from the actors, aren't they? So they got his head and scanned it. So, right. you know, maybe his hairline really has receded that much. Um, but... David. Poor chap. But, I mean, hang on. He can, he can quiff it up like that. And he can get his Just For Men out and give it a whirl. But <laughs> at the end of the day, if you've got a forehead like that. Now, I, I have to say, I think actually looking at this photograph. Yeah. If, I mean, as you say, they've gone off of a scan of him. Yeah. But I think this photograph actually, that makes sense now. Yeah. Looking at that. Yeah. Um, I just think it's because it doesn't, the, 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 Squiffy hairpiece doesn't come down enough. Right. It looks like he's got a massive forehead, but he doesn't actually. No. I mean, the face, people were saying that it doesn't look like oh, no. David Tennant. The, it does look like That is David the Tennant. best face sculpt for any David Tennant action figure. Yeah, I think it is actually. Um, the, I mean, the sculpt for his outfit is it's the great. best it's of any David Tennant so action figure. so textured. Yeah. The, the coat and stuff. Have a, have a fiddle with that. Um, and I'll take out. Um, the cosplay, only thing I would Judy say, Whittaker. actually, let me just double check to see if this is the case. Yeah. His trousers aren't as baggy as that anymore. Now, is that the mould from the original? I have a sneaking suspicion doctor? that those are his original legs. Because th that is the only thing that gives away that. Oh yes, because they've got they've got slight and they're turned up aren't yeah. they, at the bottom. So, so the, the the legs are from the original Tenth Doctor. Yeah. But the rest of it is all brand new. I'm, I'm guessing his hands probably are the original hand models um, as well. I, no, I don't think they are, actually. I think they might... Oh, no, maybe. Is that to fit a new sonic screwdriver into his hand by any Ooh, chance, Matthew? it probably is. It probably is. Uh, and obviously the coat is very loose, and you can see he's got his waistcoat underneath. So one would assume that at some point we will get him sans coat. Yeah. And with his, his white shirt sleeves out. And then we've obviously got... Um, but let's not, let's not jump straight into David Tennant's um, uh, tenure before Jodie Whittaker has had the chance to uh, say goodbye, like we have in real life. This <laughs> is the really lovely, actually... It's cool, isn't it? Jodie Whittaker action figure in her kind of ensemble uh, costume. Yeah. Um, did you read the bit about the uh, costume designer going, why the fuck have we got celery? Oh no! And the, I co the costume designer was like, "I hate the celery." Yeah. Um, when he was putting all this stuff together. Yeah. So and somehow, because they used the Abbey Shop mm, celery, mm. it looks even more fake than the one in the 1980s, which yeah. is quite a feat. Well done, everybody. Well, yeah. you still make Doctor Who look as cheap and cheerful as it used to be. Yeah. Um, and the fucking the scarves are the wrong colours. I mean, uh, yeah, about? but that drives me mad. It's the first time and only time we'll ever get a Lavazzi coloured scarf in action. Yeah, that form. is true. That's um, true. And so, from what I remember from what the guy was saying in the interview, it's Capaldi's shirt. Yeah. And it's, I don't know whose trousers it is. Is it uh, supposed to be Billy Hartnell's trousers? The, I, I hmm, well, they don't look like Billy Hartnell's. No. I'd say they were closer to Capaldi's ones, personally. But he's covered by the shirt, so I don't know whose trousers they're supposed to be. Pats, maybe? Maybe Pats. I mean, they're totally wrong. But we've got the recorder for Pats. Oh, yeah, true. So the trousers are from a doctor who we've not met yet. His I'm trousers, guessing. maybe. <laughs> maybe his trousers, maybe. Um, yeah, no, she's really good. And yeah. Again, lots of new, I mean, lots of new pieces tooling mm. uh, across the board, really. Obviously, Tennant's got lots of new body parts. So you can understand why they thought, well, we'll save a little bit of money by reusing the legs. Big time. Because he is at least wearing the same shoes. So that makes sense. And obviously, they know they're going to get their money's worth out of the torso and the new head. Uh, but am I right in saying that everything on the Whitaker is new apart from the head and the legs? Everything on the Whitaker is new apart from the head, the thigh and crotch piece, ah. and the hands. So the lower half of the legs are new? Lower half of the legs are new, okay. uh, the lower parts of the arms are new, so the upper parts are, the, are old. Interestingly, um, the lower half of the legs look like they might be quite good for a Sasha Duan action figure. Yeah, they do, don't they? You um, never know, folks. You never, you never know. know. So Maybe really... stop complaining on Twitter and maybe one day you'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and people were asking on Twitter, uh, where's the Sonic screwdriver? It's in the bottom. Oh, corner. there is a Sonic? Yeah, but oh, that's great. Jodie's one. Because Excellent. obviously, officially, we don't know what the 14th Doctor's one is like officially, um, officially. but uh, yeah it's a fantastic set it's, it's really really nice um, yeah really and cool uh, to get uh, get the doctor so quickly so I know we're not going to see him until November um, 
I, I'm guessing it's changed since you told me, but uh, I think you said half of them had sold out. I think half of them have gone, but that was a couple of weeks ago, I think, or whenever. Okay. whenever it was like the day after they went up, there was like half had gone, half or, had so, gone. or something like that. So they um, may still be available, they may not. Yeah, so get onto Characters website mm. and pre-order it now. They are with lovely. You in January. They are fabulous. And, yeah. and as we've known from what Al told us about the online exclusives, they are supposed to be one and done. Yeah, so... That's it. I'm guessing we'll probably see this guy again. As far as I'm aware, you will not see him again oh. in this costume. Okay. So this version will be slightly different. So that's why I think, you know, we'll probably see the yeah. coatless version. Obviously, everyone wants him in his coat because... Yeah. That is the look. That's the look. Um, um, and I'm, But I'm guessing this is the only time we'll see this You'll only see Jody. her in this box. Set. So if you want to get a hold of it, we should be paid commission for saying this, but <laughs> you should uh, absolutely go onto the Character Options website and order both of these because they are fantastic in the hand and have, you know, absolutely shattered any sort of iffy mm. feelings I had towards the promo pictures. Yeah. They look fabulous. Yeah. And the packaging alone. The packaging is fantastic because yeah. I'll just display that somewhere because that just looks so nice with the and, logo. And on. this backdrop reminds me a bit of the uh, regeneration set yeah. where they had the Raggedy Doctor. Oh no, it, it was Eccleston Matt. And, and no, Matt in the full. Remember they had a, they had oh, an yeah. end of time wave. They did, yes. Yeah, and yeah, it yeah. had this. It was silver with this on yeah. the back. Yeah, like yeah, very similar to that. Yeah, but absolutely really cool, beautiful really stuff. Cool. And uh, yeah, I mean, even the, even her, like the hair is probably the best it's ever looked like the I wash think on so. it it looks really good I was thinking um, it, I was wondering if it, it was a different head sculpt but yeah, I guess the um, paint applications just and a bit correct row of question marks as well my brother was very pleased um, it's the only thing Johnny will be happy about to do with a female led era of the program <laughs> um, so the only other thing maybe worth talking about happened just as we were coming into the office which yeah. is that Doctor Who uh, social media have officially announced that filming has begun mm -hmm. although I suspect it actually started earlier than they are letting on yeah um, so that's really exciting. So possibly between now and Christmas, we'll see Shooty's costume yeah. because filming will become public. Yeah. And they obviously wanted to kind of get the drop on letting people know filming was happening because, because it's likely to be out and about now. Yeah, because last time we saw anything from Shooty, which was at the Scottish BAFTAs, he mm. was asked about his costume and he said it was sort of a work in progress. Yes. So that was a few weeks back now, so mm. maybe something has been locked in. You would imagine. Um, I think they've been doing studio filming for a little bit. Yeah. And now they're out in the public for the first time, which is why they're letting everybody know. The other thing to talk about, which I think is spurious on behalf of the individuals who posted it, was this thing about Doctor Who spin-offs and villains. Yeah. Uh, which we discussed very briefly, and you'll see it uh, if you subscribe to the Review of Death Patreon. You'll see the Q&A that we did where we were discussing what we'd like to see. Mm -hmm. So we won't do that here, but... Um, I, I, I'm not putting too much in that. No, I think that's bullshit. Yeah, um, especially with the villains they listed. It yeah. Feel, and I, I have a, an impression that they'll want to go mostly new villains for Shooty's first series. Yeah. Um, whether or not that involves stalwarts like the Daleks and the Cybermen, I don't know. Yeah. But they're the only ones I can really imagine carrying a series. Yeah. I'm not sure about like a Sontaran-led series or a no. Sea Devil-led series. That to me sounds like kind of tabloid conjecture. Yeah, and I think a lot of that stuff, as we've learned from Big Finish, only works when it's the human, you know, you've got your band of humans, your resistance group. Yeah, because otherwise, Dalek you know, Empire is a fantastic series. Yeah. And that would work brilliantly in live action. Yeah. But following the adventures of Commander Skak <laughs> and his platoon of potato-headed warriors, I'm not sure. Yeah, it would be a lot of, it, yeah, it'd be wearing, I think, on mm. the senses, having to mm. watch that for... 45 minutes at a time. Of people talking like this a lot <laughs> and, and and not getting defeated and then they get into the main TV series and then they get off straight away. Yeah. So a bit like, okay, great. You know, that was a useful setup for yeah. not very much happening. Yeah. But, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. It's um, a new, brave and exciting world. Doctor Who yearbook, do we want to mention... The fact that Jodie Whittaker isn't on the front of it? Yeah. What do you think of that? Because... I have massively distanced myself from DW Twit, as it's called in abbreviated terms. Um, oh, I see, yeah. People were going a bit mad about that. People really were getting funny about it. Um, it's difficult to know what to say when we know the things that we do, but there's a reason. I, I think everybody has probably... Twigged as to what the well, reason is. Well, people say it. People without, say it. Without knowing 
the metrics of it. Yeah. So whatever you suspect is the case is is the case, yeah. basically. Um, um, but I still think for posterity, when you look back and you think, whose year was that? Yeah. Well, it wasn't David's. No. <laughs> that's the next year that's yeah, coming yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think to... I think I think it looks bad having had him on the front cover of the monthly magazine, and then having and then him immediately on the, have him on the next yeah. one. I still think that having him on the yearbook, personally, you know, there are reasons for it, but I think there are there's there's a way of getting them both on there and yeah, making think, Jody I, more prominent. Yeah, I think it just seems like just use the promo picture and slap it on the front mm. rather than commissioning somebody to do something yeah. interesting. Yeah, um, and, and that would have fused them together. But um, there are reasons behind it, and yeah. it's disappointing, um, but it's cold, hard numbers. End of the day, they got to make money, and this geezer, he sells shit. Frustratingly. I mean, yeah. not frustratingly, because Doctor Who now has a budget of £10 million an episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, this is it. I mean, it's, it's Tom Baker in the 90s all over again. Yeah. And John Pertwee in the 90s. I mean, it's the same thing with the, with the Doctor Who toys. Why are there more classic Tom Baker figures and John Pertwee era figures than any other classic Doctor? Well, those are the two popular ones, the most popular ones with the most popular stories. So, you know, you're going to want to cash in on that stuff. And it is a business. And it is a business, day. yeah. You um, know, the, the BBC is, is a strange entity apart from so many different... British television and media institutions yeah. in that it survives on taxpayers putting forward their license fee. Yeah. But then there is also this separate strand which feeds into that first bit, which relies on money coming in in this kind of greedy capitalist way. Yeah, yeah. And if somebody is looking in an office yeah. objectively with no interest in Doctor Who, and they're showing a metric system. That doctor makes more money. We'll just make more stuff yeah. with that doctor on it. Why do you think Time Lord Victorious had him on the front? Uh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, but um, but I am totally with and agree with the people that say it does undermine. It, oh yeah, Jodie Whittaker it totally does. As it's, a, it's, it's, it's appalling, really. And it's, it's unfortunate um, that yeah. that she has borne the brunt of yeah. that approach yeah. to things. But um, sadly, that is just know. the way and, things and are. And it's not it, you know it's not just her. Peter Capaldi, you know, <laughs> notoriously his stuff. You know, not much merchandise for Peter's doctor uh, because, you know, he's an old man. Don't want toys of an old man or don't want this of an old man. And I know that the arguments that would probably be, well, what about, what's his name? Mark Hamill? Is that his name? Who plays Luke Skywalker? Yeah. Mark uh, Hamill. Like action figures of him in like the most recent yeah. Star Wars movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they'll sell, but Luke Skywalker's got a bit more cachet exactly. than Doctor Who. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it is easy to yeah. forget yeah. And actually, that this the, is a business. Yeah, and even, the, you know? the, to be honest, talking to Star Wars, the, the modern film stuff really didn't sell particularly well. No. It didn't, it didn't do well. Um, and the sort of Star Wars markets kind of... Collapsed. Collapsed a little bit, yeah. At least at retail. Um, but, but that's just toys in general. Look at the new sexy Doctor Who we've got, yeah. ladies and gents. And, and he will be shifting... A lot of units of things, I am sure. Mm. Um, I mean, we just had somebody come into the room as we were setting up now going, yeah. I will now watch Doctor Who. Yeah. And my other half has said she has no interest in Doctor Who, but she likes sex ed. Yeah. And if she wasn't with me, she'd go, there's a new TV series with Shooty Gatwa in it. I will watch that. It just so happens to be called Doctor Who. Mm. And I think that that's the thing that social media sometimes doesn't quite communicate is yeah. the reality of things. Yeah. Like, it's fine to be in this microcosm of you know, we support and love mm. this thing and the people involved in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that there is a much bigger picture. That's and I it, think isn't it? sometimes yeah. we forget about the bigger yeah. picture. It's, it's, a, it's a business. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, um, that is all of the uh, hard stuff out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about a black and white episode of Doctor Who from yeah. back in the day. So this is our first time talking about a William Hartnell story, isn't No, it? it's our second time talking about a William Hartnell story, Matthew. I'm just going to fetch my notes because oh, the table yes. is back. I have brought in my copious I, I, bits I, of A4. I actually said this last week, didn't I? Whether the cameras were rolling at that point, but I did say last week, oh, it's the first time we're going to do a William Hartnell story. Well, look, hey, I mean, do you want to... Uh, not a proper one, but, you know, an actual existing William Hartnell story. Yeah, one that hasn't sort of been put out in an animated form. Yeah, one that's um, not shit. Yeah, and I think <laughs> this might be the first time, no, not first time, I'm doing a you now, 
This is either the second or third ever time we have talked about a William Hartnell story in the entirety of the review of death. Because I'm not sure we ever did a William Hartnell before we started we making never, this as a podcast. I don't think we ever did, no. Um, and is... I've just realised for, for listeners, hello everybody on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts, we have just done an exclusively visual opening segment. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe watch the, uh, the video maybe version the once it's come out later in the day and you can enjoy uh, the Jodie Whittaker and David Tennant action figure extravaganza. Yeah. But now, you can, this is your time. Yes, so let's talk about Dalek Invasion of Earth. Yes, uh, between the 1st of November and the 26th of December 1964, it was released. And I would usually just bring you one number one. Right. But because it's a six-part story, oh, right. I have three number ones. Oh, shit. But only one of them will make it onto the rod of the Pops Spotify playlist, Matthew. Oh. And I'm going to read them out. I think you can probably guess which one it is. So the first number one from this uh, run was Baby Love by The Supremes. Baby Love, my baby love, yeah. Uh, Little Red Rooster by The Rolling Stones. How does that go? I don't know, I don't like The Stones. <laughs> um, and the one that's obviously gonna end up on the playlist, I Feel Fine by The Beatles. How does that go? Um, UK, <laughs> <You> box- <know>. <laughs> UK box office, Mary Poppins was released days before the Just fight. a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, the medicine go down, medicine go down. Yes. Excellent. Uh, don't try and get ahead of the other things <laughs> by looking at my cheek. Uh, the Pink Panther, Zulu, Doctor Strange Love, A Hard Day's Night. It's been a hard day's night and I've been working like a dog. There we go. And... Grold finger. <laughs> were all released this year. Wow. Is that I and mean, this is just a microcosm of British pop culture. It really is. Wow. Michael, Everything was going Michael on. Michael Caine in Zulu. Yeah. Peter Sellers <laughs> in The Pink Panther. The Beatles in a Hard Day's Night, and they were number one for the basically the whole year. The Stones are doing well. Bond is riding high at the box office. Yeah. And Daleks are invading. London. My God. In the swinging 60s. Wow. It's the coolest time to it be alive. It really is, isn't it? Holy shit. That would be, if when people turn around to me now and say, if you could go back in time, I think I'd say November 1964. Yeah. So I can watch Doctor Who on the telly and then go and see Goldfinger. <laughs> and, and then pop down and see the Beatles live <laughs> yeah. on stage. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, and I'm wearing a t-shirt, a t-shirt, yeah, a yeah, jumper. Yeah, of course. Oh, of, nice. Uh, again, for audio listeners, apologies. It is a jumper with uh, the famous Dalek on Westminster Bridge promo shot. Yeah. I think it's probably quite difficult to understand just how impactful all this stuff was at the time. Yeah. Because you look at postcards now in shops, and when you think of like 60s things to get somebody if they're interested in the 60s. It's the Beatles, it's the Stones, it's James Bond, and it's that one postcard that is probably outside of the BBC's jurisdiction yeah. of, the BB, of the Daleks yeah. uh, queuing up for, for, a, the, for the bus. For the bus. Yeah. And it's just, it's just that moment in time. It's yeah. just, you can't get away from it. No. It's huge. Yeah. And then we have this story in the middle of it. Yeah. Six episodes. Yeah. The Dalek invasion of Earth. The first big comeback mm. for a monster. Yeah. Um, and they knew we've got a moneymaker on our hands. Yeah. Let's push everything into this. Yeah. This oh, yeah. The, second adventure. The budget on this one, the amount of times I'm like, wow, this is a really good set. And this is a really good set. And that's a really good set. I mean, I know that this story, famously, the, the set designer, Spencer Chapman, I think his name mm. was, um, he put vetoed oh, yes, on, the, yes. on the set because every time he'd send her for design, it would come back vetoed because it was too much money. So he took the piss by doing that, which is great. Uh, um, because you look at it and you think, I don't get the reference. No. So it feels so in world. Yeah. And it's supposed to be some kind of like rebel resistance yeah. slogan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it just works. You know? yeah. and, and also the Dalek graffiti. Yes, that's cool. On the cenotaph. Yeah, yeah. The BBC would get slewed by right wingers. I mean, oh they got God. they got angry about bloody Chris Evans doing donuts around it yeah. a couple of years ago. Can you imagine if they spray painted Dalek graffiti Space on it and Nazis couldn't get it off? Have, put, um, <laughs> have defaced this monument. Um, um, it, yeah, it's it's a huge moment for Doctor Who because finally they've been able to cash in on their first big success. Yeah, and it. I mean, maybe we're jumping ahead, but it works. It does work because it is you know. What else could you do? You know, you couldn't, you couldn't do just, oh, is the Daleks on another planet? Because it would have been mm. a bit poo. But bringing the Daleks 
down on Earth. Yeah. To, around all the stuff that you see every day. It had it, to happen. Yeah. And I mean, they, they get their money's worth because they the, all the location stuff mm. looks fantastic. And I mean, this is one of the stories, uh, at least from the first two um, seasons of Doctor Who, where location stuff features so prominently because so much of it is studio based before this. Exactly. Um, and it just, the, the, the scale of it, suddenly the, the program feels so much bigger when you see, even when you just see like Barbara and Jenny pushing Dortmund, Dortmund yeah. with the wheelchair because they got the space to, to run yeah. and pelt down the road. You know, they don't have to run from this side of the room to that side of the room mm. and then get out of breath and pretend, gosh, wasn't that a long journey? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, they get to do it and it just feels massive. Like there's a, a wonderful shot where you see them running away and you see the buildings mm. and you can see the rooftops and stuff. And you're like, wow, it looks massive. Um, and the same with the Daleks when they're up against, um, was it, is it Nelson's Colin or? Uh, sure. No. Sure. <laughs> oh, we're, we're from Bristol. We don't know anything yeah. about London. <laughs> well, I don't know anything about those city folk up north. Ooh. In London. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, what was I talking about? The Daleks at Nelson's the Daleks, Column, yeah, somewhere you know, they, in and London. And they look tiny. They yeah. look so small. It's yeah. like, holy shit, everything is massive. And I think, you, you know, when you jump to the, the 70s, I think that there is a bit of a disconnect. You can see, when you can see the production in Doctor Who, yeah. that's when the spell is slightly ruined. And, and that is why I've always liked pure videotape stories or totally studio-based stories. Yeah. Because it doesn't immediately jut you out and go, yeah. okay, this is being shot in a completely different format. Yeah. But when it's in black and white and it's so stark, yeah. the cuts between studio and film aren't that jarring. No. And so suddenly the story opens out. Yeah, yeah. And you don't have any excuses to sort of think, yeah, but clearly they're somewhere else. And yeah, clearly yeah. they've just left the studio and gone into Nuneaton Power Complex or whatever. Yeah, yeah. This looks expansive. Yeah. And it's funny you mention as well that the, the thing about it looks like it's had money thrown at it. Yeah. Because one of the main complaints, and we'll get onto what um, our, our viewers and listeners thought at the end, <clears throat> that I saw was it looks like it doesn't have the money to fully yeah. do the, the idea of the Daleks invading the entirety of Earth justice. Yeah. But they're, they might as well call it the Dalek invasion of London. Yeah. They mention the Indian mutiny. Yeah. We are already the conquerors of India. Yeah. You don't need to see that. No. And yes, if you had a Douglas Camfield directing this over a Richard Martin. Yeah. Maybe it would have been a bit more dynamic. Yeah. Maybe I, we wouldn't have had such static shots of certain things. Yeah. But... He was the guy that directed the first Dalek story. Yeah. And they went, well, they were a massive success in that. Why wouldn't it work twice? Yeah. And it does work. Yeah. And I actually, there's some really good shots in this story, for, uh, to be fair to him. Uh, there's one really lovely shot when Dortmund dies. Mm. And then later on, Jenny comes out. To, oh, yeah. And, and checks it, the road. Yeah. And, you can, <clears throat> and she sees the body. And the body's uh, in f right in focus in front of the frame. And she's right in the mm. distance. And... There's just this real... Obviously, it helps that it's being shot in black and white, but it feels very bleak. Very this bleak. This whole thing. Um, and, I mean, obviously, the this serial kind of gets overshadowed, I think, uh, much like the original serial, by its movie counterpart, because, obviously, it's all big, bright, and... Yeah. You know, everything. But... Um, it's, it's nice to see sort of, like, the flip side of the coin, because although the, the movie version also feels... It, well, that feels gritty, but it doesn't feel bleak in the way that this feels bleak. This really does feel like, shit, this is like the dregs yeah. of humanity <clears throat> are really clinging on. I think it's the most palatable of Terry Nation's bleak stories. Yeah. In terms of, you know, obviously repurposing it for a cinema audience where it's yeah. going to be mainly kids. Yeah. It works in that. Yeah. But it's because, I mean, I've got a list here of... of Emissions from the movie version yeah. compared to the TV version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jenny is obviously cut from the film. Yeah. Uh, which m mixes up the dynamic of who's with who and who goes yeah. where. So th there's obviously all those changes. It's really good, this story, in the way that it uses the mm. cast and how it splits them up. Mm. There's never really a point where you think, oh dear, I'm not enjoying this subplot or I'm not really, you know, they, they feel, mm. oh no. I, I, I will get onto it. Okay. Uh, but uh, I think that there is an incident which happens off screen which hampers that slightly. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in William a William Hartnell going on holiday for a week. William Hartnell apparently <laughs> being temporarily paralysed on set. What? So we'll get to that in a minute. Oh, okay. This is news to me. Uh, the Shit. Dalek Plague obviously isn't mentioned in the movie. No. Or at least it doesn't go into it yeah. as much. And which that is... becomes part of sort of Dalek lore 
going forward for other invasions. You know, uh, they always talk about death oh, of the Daleks. Yeah. Who send, oh no, actually, no, they're looking for a plague um, antidote. In that yeah, but, yeah, but you know, Big Finish. You know, mm. they use that thing a lot of like oh, the, the, the plague came first. Germ bombs. Germ bombs. Oh yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Terry Nation one hundred and one. Yeah, that. I mean, the whole thing is so is such a reflection of the Second World War. Yeah, do you know what? Obviously, a lot of people say this is the Nazi allegory and yeah. it's the first time, what if the Nazis had occupied it? I think it's difficult for people now yeah. to really see it in that context. And I have to admit, watching it over the last couple of days, I struggle to see it as strongly as most people put it across. Okay. Obviously, yes, the Daleks waving their sucker arms in a kind of upward yeah. motion. Yes, it is Nazi-esque. Yes, they're all about racial purity and they've invaded London. But beyond that, I mean, I think for me, it's, I don't I it's, struggle to see it a little it's bit. London as a, a war-torn landscape, you know, mm. it's been destroyed in the Blitz. So you've got that echo of that. You've got people sheltering underground. Mm. You've got, you know, ragtag resistance groups trying to do their bit to for sure. fight the cause. I just think if, I mean, I know that in the 70s, people were playing on, you know, Blitz sites yeah. that just didn't get cleared up yeah. in central London. If they'd maybe use some of that yeah, yeah, yeah. on location, yeah. I think it would have been more powerful. Oh yeah, sure. But obviously we're seeing pretty pristine central London yeah. being invaded by these Daleks. Yeah. And interestingly enough, obviously the most famous, you know, iconic photograph from this is the Daleks going across Westminster Bridge. Yeah. But we see it from the opposite angle in the show. Yeah. We never actually see the famous shot. No, it's with funny, isn't it? Big Ben in the background and, yeah. and all that. Um, Tyler is called Wyler in the film. Right, yeah. That's, there, there you go. Uh, no uh, crystal box intelligence test. Thank fuck. Just a comb is needed to break out of the Dalek yeah, cell in the film. it's so much better. But the Dalek still goes, you have passed the intelligence test. It's like, well, I just happened to look after my hair. <laughs> That's the only reason I got out. Um, on, uh, only the Doctor is taken to be robotized in the TV version. Yeah. Uh, Ian slash Tom and Craddock are left in the cell and it's Jenny and Barbara who are sold out by the old crones not yeah. Viola and Susan I've got a bit of information about those old crones as well is it the same bit I was just about to say you say, tell me Jean Conroy who played one of the ladies in the woods died in an accident before yeah. episode 5 was even broadcast yeah. so that was broadcast posthumously insane mad yeah so I don't know if it was the older lady or the younger one I think it's the younger one judging by the dates mm. I could be wrong I might have, I mean I'm no good with numbers but I'm pretty sure it was the younger one uh, which is just awful I can believe it unbelievable but there you go I mean there's not much else to say about that apart from yes. oh dear yeah um, <laughs> oh dear <laughs> uh, massively impactful opening yeah and obviously the poster do not bo dump bodies in the river Isn't has it? gone down in Doctor Who yeah it's it's almost it hasn't quite surpassed Doctor Who, but it's just one of those yeah things that you just you know it's 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 huge yeah it sets the tone doesn't it sets you the see tone. a man commit suicide yeah rips the rubber man rips yeah. the thing off and stumbles in I think one thing that this does better than the movie is the rubber men yes the rubber men are really I mean. Obviously, they don't require a lot of acting ability to play a Roboman. No. Can you speak like this? Yeah. Yes, you can be a Roboman. Yeah. Um, but they're like zombified and they're, you know, there's this whole thing about, uh, there's, there's a couple of allegories that you think they're like zombies. Yeah. In it, um, it was when Jenny is about to start the lorry in the British Transport Museum or wherever they are. Yeah. And she says, this will bring every Dalek for miles around if we turn this on. Yeah. And that's like a George Romero is, sort yeah, of, yeah, yeah. the zombies are going to descend upon us. Yeah. Um, they are walking corpses in this. Yeah. Rather than sort of like, you know, suited and booted biker boys. Gim gimpy, yeah. gimpy stormtroopers. And I think that it's probably easy to overlook the Robomen because compared to the movie ones, yeah. they look very cumbersome and a bit daft. Yeah. And they don't look as physically imposing. Yeah. But... Thematically, they are terrifying. In they this. are really scary. Like Annie and I were watching it together, and she said they're almost like a proto Cyberman. Mm. And it's like, well, yeah, and like the, the headpiece is very, you know, it's almost like handles on the side. Big time. Um, yeah, I think the the Robomen are of sort of an overlooked part of this story, and I mm. think of like da Dalek 
law. Yeah. You know, I think they never subjugate people in that way again. Really. No. Uh, and and they really go into detail about stuff like oh, you know, I've seen them like malfunction and go mad and like smash their heads against walls and stuff. And you're like Jesus Christ, this mm. is really horrible. Mm. Um, and I mean, I and again, we're getting ahead, but. That sequence where um, the guy that Ian's with, uh, when he meets his brother and he's been robotized yes. and they kill each other. Larry and Phil. Larry and Phil. It's so, it's tragic. Yeah, it's, it's so really he, awful. He strangles his brother. Yeah. And his brother spills his guts yeah. with his sten. Yeah. In his, ch- it's, it's really, weird. it's really grim. Yeah. Um, I have a, a note here. William Russell absolutely twats one over the head with a kosh in episode four. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, and Hart, no, he's, he's oh yeah, he smacks one. Yeah. one. And uh, we'll we'll talk about that line in a minute because yeah. he says a line after that which yeah. I find really interesting. Uh, Kenton Moore, who plays Noah in the Ark in Space, is an uncredited Robo Man in the story. Holy shit! There we go. Um, so obviously you have that opening. The Robo Man commits suicide. He wades into the water, mm. and then the TARDIS arrives. Yeah. And then you've got that nice opening scene where they're kind of getting their bearings, and they think, right, there's no bird song, mm. not even the chimes of old Big Ben. Yeah. And I don't know if it's revisionist to say this, just because we know what happens at the end of the story. Yeah. But do you not feel like this holds a certain weight to it in the same way that an episode like Earthshock or Genesis does at the start? Yeah. You think. Something's going to happen here. Yeah, it really does. And I don't know what it is. Yeah. And it might be easy to say that because you're like projecting what you already know. Yeah. But there's like a line where Susan asks if it's selfish that she wants everybody to stay together mm. and that everything should be the same and not change, yeah. which is obviously big foreshadowing. Yeah. But there's a bit where the doctor also compliments Ian. He goes, hmm, that was very intuitive of you or something. Yeah. And you think, okay, they've bonded, they're tight, they want you to know that. Yeah. So what's going to happen in this story that breaks, breaks that, that family unity? apart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when it happens, it's very organic. Yeah. Because you, you know, you've got six episodes to play with, and you can plant these little bits through mm. the story where Susan and David start to get closer yeah. and they start to be a bit pally. Yeah. But even from her first line, it's like he says to Barbara, "Can you cook?" Yeah. What do you do to Susan? And she says, "I eat." Yeah. And it's like, I've never heard her talk to anybody like that before. But yeah. there's this immediate sort of rapport between them, which is really cool to see. Yeah. Um, yeah, and all the stuff when they're at the campfire with the fish and, you know, they almost kiss and all the grandfather's coming and all this sort of stuff. And he says something like, uh, mm, something's cooking. Yeah. And, and that's I, nice. And, and then when they rush off and he says, you go and do something and don't stop to pick daisies on the way. It's a yeah, yeah. lovely little line. But the bit that we laughed at was when he goes, oh, yeah, Susan's a very good cook. <laughs> as if to say, she's good marrying material. Because you should, she's this, a keeper. Yeah, this is the 60s. So, uh, you know, she's good in the kitchen. As long as she can do a pie, then you're all right. <laughs> yeah. Don't need to worry about if you get on in real life. <laughs> um, also cool to have a story, and I don't think we really get a sort of subversion of Doctor Who coming in to try and save things before mm. shit is kicked off until the arc. Yeah. Where the Doctor has arrived post-invasion. Yeah. And he, there's nothing he can do to stop it. Yeah. They've already yeah, conquered it. Earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though you have to Conquer destroy Conquer the Earth, all you poor vetted creatures. Yeah. That's uh, a great line of dialogue. Yeah, it's good. Um, although the melodramatic, we are the masters of Earth. Now, for the longest time, my brother and I thought that they were saying, we are the bastards of Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to it again. It we is masters. are the bastards of Earth. It is masters. On that note, mm. uh, this is my hot take. And I don't think I've ever seen anyone talk about this. Go on. Uh, I could be wrong, mm. but people always moan about Dare the Daleks having shit Dalek voices. I think the voices in Dalek Invasion of Earth are shit. There is one time in this episode where they're yeah. good. And that's the, the POV. Secret. Yeah. Which is really odd. I, I mean, I guess that the idea is that you're inside the casing, so they've tweaked the modulation up, yeah. or that they've pushed the threshold, because it sounds a lot more distorted. Yeah. But that is the sound of the Daleks you get from that from point, point on. on. Yeah. And so they must have gone, oh, yeah, that sounds really good. It's a shame we can't dub the rest oh, of yeah, the story. Yeah. So, I mean, they don't sound like... They sound all right in the Daleks. They sound more grav. They sound more imposing in this. It just sounds like some uh, Peter Hawkins is doing this a lot. Oh bugger! We didn't plug the, vo- the ring modulator in. Yeah, it doesn't sound modulated. No. Uh, but I don't like Dalek voices until we get to the chase. Anyway, I yeah. think the Daleks and Dalek Invasion of Earth. Oh yeah, yeah. Both sound like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also, they've got a weird way of. Sp- they sound a lot more human. Yeah. In their pattern of speech. Yeah. 
And there's one bit where I think it's the Saucer Commander or maybe the the the, uh, the Black Dalek yep. goes over to a control unit. Yes. And it goes, um, or it kind yeah. of like uh, yeah, crumbles it's a, or yeah, something. Yeah. And you think, well, as far as they're concerned, in that thing is a little man. Is like a little honey badger or something. Yeah. <laughs> not not like a bubbling mass of hate. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. Know? But it is a living creature, so why, does, yeah, why wouldn't it do that? It juts you out of it, though. Yeah. Because Daleks... Daddy, help, my feet are sore peddling this <laughs> thing around. <laughs> and, oh, my God, can you hear those props yeah. on the rattling set? Rattling about. Yeah. Rattling around. I yeah. mean, they are bloody loud. Yeah. Um, Susan somehow brings an entire bridge down on the TARDIS. Yeah. Is she Hulk Hogan? I think she must be. I mean... And it annoys me because, obviously, they do it very well in the film. But in that, in the series, you know, that girder comes down. Mm. I'm like, why don't you just... Susan could literally just pop underneath, open the door. And There's get in. that, but in the t in this in this version, Ian. Hey, what's that noise? It's probably a fly trapped in something. Fucking fly. I mean, the a the, hornet trapped in something. The aircon's off. Okay, it's getting quieter. It's perished. Um, <laughs> That, uh, it's when Ian goes over to the, the, the TARDIS yeah. and there's this massive thing in front of it and goes, it seems to be primarily this girder. <laughs> no shit. You can't get in unless... It, and then he goes, well, maybe I could find a crowbar to move it. Not that, mate. No. Not unless you want to bring the whole of London down on you. Yeah. And then, you know, there's the whole acetylene torch thing. They go off into the warehouse. What I love about that, though, when talk, that, that sequence, is when William Hartnell's like, hmm, how long have we been here? Uh, tw uh, at least 20 minutes? I was like, well, no, we've been here about five minutes. I can see on BritBox <laughs> yeah. that the episode hasn't been going for that long. Yeah. Like, oh, for a Time Lord, your uh, understanding of time is pretty poor. Shall we talk about um, the Doctor wanting to spank Susan for being a bad girl? I mean, obviously here, it makes sense. Because it's his granddaughter and she's cocked up mm. majorly, so... What she needs is a jolly, jolly good, good smack, smack bottom. bottom. Yeah. Meanwhile, Bill does not need a jolly no. good smack bottom. And um, that is that is the moment people are referencing when they take the piss out of that line, right? Because yeah. in this context, it's fine. Yeah, you right. know, you don't, yeah. Good. Um, nothing to really talk about in episode one until, I think at least, we get the Dalek reveal. Uh, yeah, I mean, really all I've put here is all the stuff that we've talked about, the war, mm. location stuff. Shame the Dalek. Oh, well, the Dalek hasn't turned up yet. So yeah. So yeah, you're, you're, you're quite right, really. The Dalek emerges from the Thames. No indication it's a Dalek story until no, that which happens. which is great. Brilliant. I mean, n now you'd get people wearing t-shirts with irises on them. Yeah, yeah. Like in Bloody Day of the Daleks, or whatever yeah. it is, you know. But lovely moment where they turn around and the Dalek comes out. It's kind of a shame you don't get the Doctor's reaction as the cliffhanger. Yeah. Rather than, I mean, but obviously that cliffhanger is is got to be. Top ten, yeah. top twenty cliffhangers of all time. Yeah, it's a shame, isn't it? Because you, you sort of, do you see them react? So you see the Dalek coming out, and then they turn around yeah. and run for it, and then they get the kind of yeah, you shot almost, reaction. you almost want, to see, you don't want that first Dalek shot. You want to see them turn, then and see the then reaction, and out. think, what the fuck have they seen? And then it's a Dalek, and then you go, holy shit, it's exactly. a, a Dalek. But yeah. so, shall we talk about the Daleks in this story? Yeah, they themselves aren't great. No. But the scale of the story and the way that the narrative unfolds around, you know, a, a London in bits and, and so on, it gives them weight. Yeah. In a way that I don't think they really get that kind of weight through the rest of the 60s. Obviously, they have great stories where the Daleks themselves individually are brilliant. Yeah. The chase narratively, okay, we're going all across time and space or whatever, but you can't you know, physically see that distance being travelled. Yeah. But this is London, decimated by the Daleks. Yeah. And it really gives a lot of weight to them, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. it's the most impressive part. Oh, very much so. Yeah. About the Daleks in this story. Um, yeah, like, 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 like I said at the start, you know, I think this was exactly what it needed mm. to really make them the, the, the mon monuments of pop culture that mm. they ultimately became. Because they, you see them walking, going around, walking, gliding around yeah. London, and it just, it's kind of inconspicuous, but, you know, it, it, it's its obvious that these are not from here. Yeah. And yet they, you know, maybe it's the fact they're in black and white, but they just fit the, what you're seeing 
mm. you know, because you just know that Daleks are part of British pop culture of that time. Yeah. And they just look great wandering around yeah. central London. Yeah, I mean, and it's funny watching those early Dalek stories because they're sort of proto-Daleks in, mm. their, in, in a way because, you know, the lexicon isn't quite there yet because there's yeah. a lot of kill them or yeah. kill, kill, kill. You know, exterminate mm. is very, very used, rarely very used. rarely used. And mm. it's, yeah, it's weird when you go back and you're like, oh, this, you should be saying exterminate here. Exactly. Um, and I guess it's only until, it, it, it sort of bleeds into the story a bit more in the later parts where like, oh, you will be exterminated or exterminate. Exterminate, exterminate, exterminate. Yeah. I think when Ian is in the bomb, there's somebody coming out. There's somebody coming out of the bomb. Exterminate, exterminate yeah, him. Yeah. You know, that is the first time you get a proper oh, okay. rallying cry of it. Yeah, and I guess um, they were like, oh, this is cool. Kids are saying it in the playgrounds. Yeah. There's nothing scary about that at all. <laughs> um, and also episode two has a fantastic bit, and I think this is a massively overlooked moment in sort of early Doctor Who, where Craddock, and I think it's... Yeah, so it's Craddock in the Dalek Saucer and David in the Underground Hideout. Yeah. Between them, they split the story of what happened in the lead up yes. to the Daleks invasion Lovely. and it cuts between different moments there yeah. and it's just so good and that's yeah. where you get the mention of germ bombs yeah. and they were they, you know they were lying in wait waiting yeah. for the earth to get weak and then they invaded yeah. and that is a great scene it's a really clever way of delivering a lot of backstory mm. um and it pads the story out. It pads the story you're out. You're not as actually well. having to move anything on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you've got a really impactful dramatic moment. Yeah. Because there are parts in this story where the padding yeah. really rears its head or yeah. becomes obvious. Yeah. I mean, well, like we said, that you know, him doing the bloody the the, the logic thing with the bloody yeah. magnifying glass and fannying around with all that. I mean, there's a lot of fannying around. That first um, location scene where um, Barbara's I mean, running around. Could you imagine if it was him now, if he was in that story? Oh, I'll just get my size good right And then that'd be it. Yeah. yeah, it'd be like three episodes long. <laughs> yeah. um, but the Daleks kind of spend most of their time buzzing around in flying saucers and yeah. delivering radio broadcasts. That's kind of it, Yeah. really, in the story. Yeah. So in terms of the Daleks actually doing things, yeah. not an awful lot happens. Yeah. But it's and more guess, about what they've already done. Yeah, and I guess that's why the Robomen work so well, is because, I mean, there's obviously the, the, the bloody Daleks themselves are a lot bigger yeah. because they've built them that way so they can traverse the streets of London. Yeah, they're fenders. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it looks um, great. Oh yeah, it's really funny. There's that bit where the Doctor says to Ian in episode two, where he's like, well, have you noticed anything different about them, my dear boy? And they're like, and he's like, uh, he's like, those discs on their back. He's like, fuck the discs. Look they're, at those massive, great big fenders they've they got. They've got big batties, boy. Yeah. Let's talk about that first. Yeah, it's like, okay. Um, yeah, but I mean, like, the, the, the sets look great, like, mm. in terms of the landing area in is Chelsea, really yeah, cool. Yeah. Chelsea had a pad. Uh, inside the spaceship is really great. The Robo Men mm. uh, creating machine looks fantastic. Oh yeah, because it's, it's, it's all pumping it's, it's and the... built on. So it's not on the studio floor. Yeah, so it's on a rostrum, of, isn't it? Of Ian hiding underneath. Yeah. the the saucer. Which yeah, is so great. that's really cool. Uh, and then you've got all the stuff in the sewers, which is again, you know, you're like, wow, this is lots of levels yeah. to these sets mm. which I think really makes it it gives it a scale that like you said if you're not on the studio floor mm. it and doesn't it, feel so flat and low and it's the decay as well that they get so they, they nail yeah like the, the first location they arrive in obviously at the side of the Thames you've got this beautiful actually it's, a, it's like a corner of the set but like the corner of it is held up by a pillar yeah and it's all brickwork around it yeah. Susan's climbing up it yeah. stuff's falling down and then uh, there's that bit where it's, it's, the, it's the set they use where the, the bomb is sort of deposited at the end of yeah. episode three. Um, and that's got like a ramp that the Daleks yeah, can yeah. kind of manoeuvre yeah. around and stuff. That, that scene where that guy's like, it's all right, I, I'm going to try it on my own. And he walks around the corner and then immediately into a Dalek. It's like, wow, you mean, were you not, could you not see that fucking great big dustbin coming towards you? Come on. I love it. Having said that, uh, the stuff in the sewers yeah. and the stuff in the mine across episodes four and five, yeah. I think that's where this story gets its oh. reputation for big time drag factor yeah. and where you need to shave time out of it. Yeah. Because when you look at the movie version, obviously none of the sewer stuff it, yeah, it, survives. Yeah, it whistles along. Um, and I, that, so that is kind of the that is, yeah. where the drag factor comes into it. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, what have we got here? We've got the baby crocodile. 
Very which f- looks very cute. Yeah. And doesn't look threatening in the slightest. No, but I mean, I, I guess you think for a lot of people in 1960s London, or London, 1960s Britain, sorry, mm. probably never seen a real crocodile. No. So they're probably, and you know, on their fuzzy little tellies, they probably think, oh shit, that's, that, that's a crocodile, that's scary. And it's that Terry Nation thing where like, everything is a danger to you. Yeah. Like you go into the sewers and yeah, I mean like loads of animals escape from the zoo so all the reptiles have bred down here. Yeah. And you're just left with that and you yeah. think, shit. And, and but the problem is you see it. Yeah, that's the trouble. And I mean, it's they also plant the seed of like, oh, there's people down here like scavenging and stuff and you think, oh my God, there's going to be some like really fucked up people. Mutos. Yeah, sort of thing. But that nothing becomes of that. And you almost think, well, maybe that should have been the thing that they encountered, not the crocodile. The other thing, of course, is the slither. Yeah. Which sounds terrifying. Yeah, that... Oh. <laughs> but... It's really creepily... It, very shot, creepy. that stuff. Well, I mean... Until you... Until see- part five. Yeah. Episode five. Um, the Waking Ally. Who is The yeah. Waking Ally, Matthew? Uh, I'm sorry, I was <laughs> turning into a slither there. Um, <laughs> the Waking Ally. Uh, I'm trying to remember what happens in episode five. Uh, un- yeah, I mean, because they've met the uh, character that, what's his face, who plays um, Solon. Oh, yeah, uh, Philip Mannix's character. They've met character. his character, whatever yeah. he's called. Um, so he's not an ally. He's, and, and that is a character that gets expanded on in the film much yeah. better, is the yeah. guy who's trading stuff. And I think that, that Ian's story, you know, because the only thing that really happens with Ian is he encounters the Slither. Yeah. And then gets trapped in the bomb. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah, that is a bit weird. And then manages, like, okay, yes, I know Dalek technology enough to just pull all these cables out and, and suddenly it, it will stop. Yeah. Rather than going... Is it? I mean, I suppose you can't do it in black and white, but is it the red cable yeah. or the blue cable? And which one of them is, is going to the blow this thing up? Is it the grey one or the other grey one? Is it <laughs> or the slightly darker grey one? slightly black one. Um, yeah, like, I think Ian is the only... Of, of those sort of stories, because you kind of touched on it earlier, yeah. that's the, you know, the, the sub-story that doesn't quite work for me. Yeah, because all the stuff with Jenny... Jenny's a great character, because she's great. so prickly and horrible, mm-hmm. and you think, gosh, she's a cow. And then you hear all the stuff about her brother, and... You know, well, like... she, she feels like she's been brought up in this world. Yeah. Uh, and you, you sort of... Yeah, I, I, I like her. Um, and her journey with Barbara is great. Um, yeah, and like the encounter with the old women. Or the, well, the old woman and the younger woman. You know, they are creepy as well. Yeah. That whole thing is... I mean... The, the old crone in particular, yeah. it feels like something out of a fairy tale. When like, she oh, don't put, go into that cottage. She because, looks at it through the curtain yeah. and goes, well, it would have got her anyway. Yeah. That's really scary. It's really horrible. Uh, yeah, and you think, like little kids watching this back in the day, you just shit your pants. Definitely. Now, let's talk about the narrative uh, and the fact that in episode four, we have a bit of an issue here. So William Hartnell, apparently... And I double checked this on a couple of different sources, and it came up on other websites with different citations. So I'm, right. I'm, I'm assuming this is correct. Okay. In the scene where they're being rescued from the Dalek saucer, yes, he was apparently carried out by this actor Richard McNeff, who plays Baker. Right. Uh, and I was watching the episode, and I thought, okay, well, what I'm seeing here doesn't necessarily lead to what this story is saying, but I'm assuming it was maybe taped again. He apparently dropped William Hartnell when the ramp that they're on yeah. gave way. Right. And Hartnell went back first into a camera stand and it apparently temporarily paralysed him. Oh my God. Um, which means he misses the recording for the end of tomorrow. Yeah. Because you have that bit where he kind of stands up to go towards the bomb and then, oh no, it's the drugs that are wearing off. And then yeah. he goes and has a nice holiday in Sardinia. Yeah. Um, which is a, a problem with 60s Doctor Who that, is yeah. that the regulars just disappear for yeah. long periods. Could you imagine that these days? No. <laughs> can you, imagine? you can at least zoom us shooty, get back to us now. You know, yeah. there's no excuse for you not to be in this story. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, that and the journey through the sewers, which seems to happen twice, because yeah. they sort of get to where they need to go in the sewers and they go, well, we need to go back and get Grandfather. And then they go yeah. and get the Doctor and they come back again. Yeah. And that is where it kind of stutters a little bit. Yep. And yeah, for that fourth episode, because he's quite involved in the narrative, you really miss William Hartnell. Yeah. 
And I think that that is sort of a problem with the story as well. Like, that's where the, the drag factor comes in. Yeah, because he's very... I love that bit in episode two, you know, that, that when he first encounters the Daleks. And the first thing is... Oh, no, you, were, you, you you know, not for long. When it's mm. like, oh, we've we already conquered Earth, they're not, you know, the masters of Earth, or not for long. Mm. And it's like a really nice doctor defining moment of like, oh, okay, you know, we've seen him being a bit more selfish earlier on mm. in the first season. And now he's really starting to become the character that we, you know, we now know and love. Um, and then later on, when he sort of says to Susan, oh, you know, we can go back to the TARDIS. And mm. then when David comes along, he's like, right, so this is our battle plan, you know, and he takes Susan's ideas for his own. It's lovely. It's really nice. The, the, the way that they write the Doctor and Susan's relationship in this story is very well done. Um, and it, it, that, that then makes the, the finale all the more heavy hitting. Should we get to that? We, let's talk about that. So Carol Ann Ford decides to leave the series because she's unhappy with, Susan's character development. Yeah. If you can call it a character. Yeah. I mean, she's obviously been told she's not going to be some damsel in distress screaming and being rescued all the time. Yeah. But unfortunately, I suppose it's a problem that writers in the 80s encounter. Yeah. Where you've got all these characters, what can you do with them? Yeah. Somebody has to kind of be the fall guy girl. Yeah. And Susan, unfortunately, ended up being the screaming yeah. damsel in distress. Yeah. So she apparently spends a weekend with William Hartnell. At Terry Nation's gaff. Right. Where they discuss how is she going to be written at the show. Interesting. But the departure sequence of how much of it, I'm not sure, I don't know if it's all Bill's bit or the whole sequence, is actually written by David Whittaker. Right. Not by Terry Nation. Okay. Which you can sense, I think. Yeah. Because I can't imagine Terry Nation writing that scene. No. It's very sentimental. Yeah. And he doesn't do sentimentality. He does cold, hard... Yeah. Characters called Tarrant getting killed by plagues and yes, guns yeah. and shit, you know. That's his thing. And women are just there to look pretty, like in Blake 7. <laughs> and injure their ankles. <laughs> yes. Um, there's a... That, I think that whole last, what is it, sort of like 10 minutes? Yeah. Which starts with the Doctor going over and checking on Susan. Yeah. And she's got a hole in her shoe. Yeah, all that stuff. And you think, okay, this is definitely projection. Yeah. But, it, you know, Doctor Who's an awful lot of running. Yeah. And she's got a hole in her shoe. Yeah. Maybe it's time to pack it in. Yeah. And maybe that's the first indication. Obviously, he's seen that there's a thing between Susan and David. Yeah. But maybe that's the kind of impetus where he goes, all right, maybe you need to settle down and stop all this yeah. nonsense. Um, and buy a new pair of shoes. Yeah. And for Tattle God's sake, <laughs> look after yourself because you look a state, young woman. Um, and he still, he didn't, she didn't get her shoe back. She doesn't get her shoe back. Yeah. It's Don't the get... year 2164, I think, they see in a calendar. It is 20, well, it's 2164 on the calendar. I think the idea is okay. that this is bit, it, well, bit, We know which later. century we're in, dear yeah. boy, I think. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So, where's she going to get a new pair of shoes? She's going to pop down to Primark. Primark's been obliterated. I mean, David does say there's a department store that's got loads of supplies in it. Oh, okay. So maybe she can get the, the latest 21-something-something mm. something yeah. fashion. Which looks suspiciously like 1960s fashion. But... Odd that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and there's a, ni a nice bit as well, because, you know, obviously everybody centres around the speech. Yeah. And um, uh, Carol Ann Ford's acting with, with, I forget the name of the guy who plays David, but yeah. he's fabulous. And that whole scene where... He says, I can give you a life where you can live yeah. and da 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 da. Is I can lovely. give you a life where you can do my dishes and make my dinner. And you can have my babies. <laughs> you can and, have my babies. And you can shut your mouth if you want to <laughs> get out of the house. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and there's a really nice bit. And I, I mean, I don't know if it's quite being played like this. I like to think it is where William Russell and uh, Jacqueline Hill are sort of talking to him. Yeah. And Ian takes this approach of sort of. So, um, you know, you've got a job, you, you know, you, you've got yourself together, what are yeah, your yeah. prospects? Okay. And Barbara's doing this thing where she's sort of trying to shuffle, yeah, like, yeah, they obviously on. are going to have the chats, like, yeah, let's yeah, just get yeah. out of the way. And that is lovely as well. Yeah. And then, of course, we have the Doctor who's just sort of resigned himself to the fact that this has to happen. Mm. And then we have the speech. Yeah. Which actually had a couple of lines missing. Uh, yes, I read this. So what were the lines? You I have think them you here? need to perform them as William Hartnell. Uh, so, blah, 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 blah. yeah. Uh, it's not oh, going to oh be my. quite at the level of Tom <laughs> Webster, but we'll we'll, we'll try no. and get there. Um, so is this after? Shall I, I, shall I, shall I do the full? Go on, and then drop the character. 
One day I shall come back. Yes, I shall come back. Until then, there must be no regrets, no tears, no anxieties. Just go forward in all your beliefs and prove to me that I am not mistaken in mine. Work hard, both of you. Be gentle with her, David. <laughs> and show her that life on Earth with love and understanding can be a great adventure. And a jolly good rogering. And, jolly, and remember, love is the most precious jewel of all. I'm kind of glad they... William Hartnell forgot what his lines were. And you know what? I think he... Um, I think he did. Because he has a terrible time in episode six yeah the bit i mean like he's not actually getting the lines wrong necessarily yeah but he is very flustered yeah all the way through episode six yeah so i think i mean it, it appears that these were cut for time in the studio yeah and so what we get is william hartnell maybe forgetting yeah a lot of what he's supposed to say but what you get is the definitive version yeah and i tell you what he acts the shit out of that. Yeah. And it is the best bit of acting that William Hartnell does yeah. in the entire series. Because it's from the heart, isn't it? Because he does, you know, we know that William Hartnell didn't want her to go. Um, and I guess that is, that, that's just why it works. Um, there's a sincerity in his there's eyes. There's a sincerity. Whereas when you add all this stuff about, oh, you know, be gentle with her, love is like this, and blah, 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 that just feels like, you know, sentiment for, the, for sentiment's sake. Whereas what, he delivers on screen feels more natural. Because when you look at this written down, it is a lot more sort of emotional. Yeah. But the way he says it, the yeah. way, you know, like you say, he obviously didn't want Caroline Ford or any of the regulars to leave. And yeah. you can kind of see his shoulders droop as you get through his tenure yeah. and then, you know, more people come on board and then leave him. Yeah. Um, yeah, it must have been weird for him. You know, it must have been older, awful. Like, oh, well, who are you? Really, you know? really must have been really sad for him. And so when you see him delivering those lines, you're right. When you look at him, you think he means this yeah. in a way that you don't see William Hartnell perform in any other context yeah. in that way in the show. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's 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 the most iconic moment mm. of the black and white era of Doctor yeah. Who, really. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why they plonked that at the start of The Five Doctors, and, you know, they, I think they bookended Adventure in Space, Space and Time, time with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, ignoring Big Finish, uh -huh. do you think there's a reason why the Doctor never came back? Because he still hadn't fixed his shoe, and he thought, God, if I turn up <laughs> now, all this time later, and I still haven't fixed that shoe, I don't actually know where I've left that shoe, you know what? Forget it. I, that is a very review of death way of putting it. I, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, we'll leave it as that. We won't get <laughs> sentimental and actually talk about the deep, intricate layers of the Doctor's character. Um, there's a couple of a little bits and bobs just that I picked up. If you've got anything else, please uh, let us know. I'm just having a little look. Um, bubbly, 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 boo. Um, no, I think a lot of it is... Uh, like, Dortmund's Sacrifice, that's also really good. That is very good. Yeah, mm. because he leaves the book, doesn't mm. he, for them. Because for I the, think For he, the bomb formula. Yeah, because I think he knows deep down, I'm slowing them down because, mm. you know, I'm in a wheelchair and chances are this isn't going to work because yeah. throwing these cans of smoke at these bloody things aren't doing bugger all. And there's a, there's a weird bit where he chucks the bomb at the Daleks and there's a sound effect of an explosion... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but the smoke machine just turns up on location. Um, yeah, so they actually call his wheelchair, they actually make reference to it in the TV version, which they don't in the movie. No. Because I, th I think Tyler kind of apologises for reminding him he's in a wheelchair. Yes. And that's it, a, yeah, that's a really well A really nice scene, yeah. moment. And yep. um, that's very short, that bit, actually. Yep. But yeah, really nice. Uh, anything else? Um, oh, there's a lovely bit of dialogue from William Hartnell, which is he's talking to Tyler about, or oh, you know, starting off, you know, this is this is your chance to begin a new world. It's very reminiscent of what he says to the Thals um, in the first and, Dalek uh, in story. the first Dalek story, uh, and then he you have the the bells of Big Ben chime, That's a lovely which, bit. and then he goes just. The Mm. And he does do a lovely little tap and he yeah. kind of holds his, his yeah. shoulder. And, yeah, and it's just those little moments where it's like, oh, he's bloody good, William Hartnell. He's, he's, he, there's the magic of his doctor. He has got a magic to him. Yeah, he's very. it's a twinkle. It's fantastic. But but I think it, it 
his tenure is one that rewards when you really watch it. Yes. Because it, that twinkle isn't as obvious as like Pat. No. And John is obviously swashbuckling and yeah. he's, you know, very on the, on the nose with, you know, how heroic and adventurous he is. Yeah. But the first Doctor has those moments as well. Mm. It's just that you have to kind of find them. Yeah. And and that is why watching his his tenure is is more rewarding, I think. Yeah. I mean, he his character grows so much from the first story, mm -hmm. I mean, just even to now. Uh, and I think even when you get to the rescue, I think his character metamorphosizes again because he becomes even softer and yeah. even more of a cuddly character in, in a lot of ways. I think he feels more protective when Vicky comes aboard because he's like, well, I've lost Susan. Yeah. And maybe I wouldn't have lost Susan if I wasn't such a grumpy old git at times. So I'm going to really take care of this one. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's... Just... No, I, I, think, I, think that's, I think that's bang on. Um, um, uh, so I've got I've got some just bits of production that I okay. sort of noticed. So on the Dalek saucer, you can very faintly hear Daleks talking in the background, or right. at least I thought it was Daleks. Oh, at around the twenty minute mark in episode three yeah. is when it becomes the most obvious. <clears throat> and if you're wearing headphones, you then cannot tune it out. Right. When Dortmund sends Barbara off to find Jenny, yeah, you can hear either the floor manager or somebody in the gallery talking in somebody's cans. Ooh. And it is so loud that you can hear them queuing cameras. Oh, really? And queuing camera positions. Oh, wow. And so n now, going back and watching the rest of Dalek Invasion of Earth, yeah. I've realised they are not Daleks, just in the soundtrack in the background. You can hear them talking. Yeah. It is somebody it's in the somebody gallery like... relaying camera instructions. Uh, very interesting. So, I mean, you can always hear people coughing and stuff, in, in, especially in the early scenes. And cameras actually. rolling across yeah. the floor. Yeah. <coughs> But, Who's coughing in this room with only two people? <laughs> <laughs> in this cell. Yes. Um, but, yeah, 20 minute mark in episode three. Once you hear it, you will not be able to tune it out for the whole thing. So oh, okay. I'm glad I have ruined that for other people as well. Thank you. Uh, when we cut to the first Doctor being robotized uh, to the attack on the Dalek saucer, mm -hmm. uh, you can hear William Hartnell yelling from across the studio. Oh, really? Somebody hasn't cued him. Okay, we're actually over, over there now. You need to stop acting. <laughs> so you can hear him still going, oh, oh. <laughs> Um, it's a really. <laughs> I thought you were saying that he was like, "Oh bloody hell, what's going on?" It so had gone wrong, and he was yelling at somebody. No, oh, no, it's no, just, no. It's, oh. He's just acting a I bit just, too I, much. Oh, fair enough. I, I love the idea that he was having a go at someone. Go the bloody way, <laughs> Bill. We're actually still recording him. <laughs> oh, shut up. Um, cool effect when the Daleks blast a section of wall during yeah. the saucer attack, and it bubbles. Yeah, cool. Those optical effects. Yeah. would have been a lot harder to do mm. in 1964 yeah. than when they get CSO. Yeah. Like, that is literally somebody manipulating the image. Yeah, yeah, it's you know? really cool. It's amazing. Um, Dortmund, in this episode, refers to the Dalek casings being made of Dalekanium. Yeah. First time that's mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, we talked about the modulation and the Daleks' POV. Yeah. Uh, but what did the listeners slash viewers think mm. of it? Matt, do you want to take the first one? Uh, so, Dave Jarvu said, uh, I'll say it's one of the few 60s Doctor Who stories to hold the attention of non-fans, i.e. family, throughout. In my experience, they have criticised the film as being a bit hammy, yet this manages to be grittier and more dramatic with the same material. A classic. Hmm. And I think that's really what we said, wasn't it? The yeah. Is that it, it, it's a much darker take on that story. You can see later Terry Nation stuff outside of Doctor Who, stuff like Survivors, yeah. sort of emanating from Very much this. so, yeah, yeah. Jonathan Reed, love it. It was my first Dalek story and my first first Doctor story as part of the 40th anniversary Dalek collector set. So it's very special to me. Many great and memorable moments, such as when the Doctor and Ian first encounter the Daleks and Susan's farewell, which are the two sort of most prominent moments everybody sort of discusses. But yeah. I kind of hope through maybe listening to this and watching this, people... We'll sort pick of see up the other little moment. bits yeah, because yeah, yeah. I, I discovered a, a sort of a few more moments yeah. as well. Interesting, you know, saying a, a, about um, when he first encountered this, it was weird when I opened the box of the DVD mm. and it's had the 40th anniversary logo on it. I thought, holy shit, yeah. you are not telling me yeah. that this DVD is 20 years old. I know, I know. 
So I'm going to be moving to New Zealand in the year, new year. And if anybody <gasps> wants my DVD collection, wow. please let me know. Oh my God. There are obviously some I'm going to be keeping hold of. I've got a copy of like Carnival of Monsters signed by Katie Manning and right. The Twin Dilemma signed by Colin. He was very happy to sign that, I can tell you. No, oh, bless um, you. So yeah, but I, I will be getting rid of a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, it's me. Uh, Sister Muzen said, bit dull. You can already <laughs> tell Terry Nation has got a formula. Not a fan of Susan's exit. Going off with blokes she barely, barely knows as the Doctor forcibly ejects her from the ship and setting the template for most other exits. Um, kind I, of. I, kind of, but I actually think this is done much better compared to, you know, the invasion of time when Lena mm. just suddenly decides to cop off with Andrid. Yeah. Uh, you know, this they, they set this up much earlier on and they keep referring to it throughout. Uh, so I think this is much better. Big time. Um, yeah, I mean, all right, maybe perhaps the Doctor shouldn't have just been like, go off with the first bloke you clap your eyes on. No, but it's but, not like he hasn't been there and seen it, yeah. that there's something. Yeah. You know, it's, it's different. Yeah, like yeah. The, the Lila one is... Yeah, that's smelly what, poo time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And again, the same with like Vicky departing because she mm. fancies some Greek bloke. <laughs> <laughs> um, Laurie doesn't quite live up to its promise. Perhaps under Christopher Barry or Douglas Canfield, the whole thing would have come together nicely. But under Richard Martin's flat direction, it's a bit flaccid. 2150 AD is by far the superior version. And even that's not perfect. Mm. Yeah, I think there's definite, definite arguments to suggest this is... You know, better in movie form. Yeah, and I think, like Laurie was saying, I think the action stuff would have been shot far better had mm. it have been um, Chris Barry or Ducky Canfield. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think, yeah, a except for a few shots where Richard Martin obviously had like a stroke of genius and thought, oh, this would look nice. Well, the Daleks um, are shot really nicely. Daleks are shot really nicely, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, 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 can, I know what Laurie means. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I think that's might be and yours that's me again. again. Uh, Tom Webster says, is it, uh, 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 <laughs> it, it is, uh, um, yes, it is, yes, it is quite the spirit of adventure. Oh, there we go. Don't you think? Um, uh, Eternal Feline, a classic. Forget that it's got padding and suffers from a lack of budget. There's plenty to commend. It's a very sad story, not least Susan's departure. Very bleak premise, blatantly influenced by the then recent shadow cast by the war. Yeah. Again, yes. But I have to say, I, I I just didn't see it as much on this rewatch. Interesting. It wasn't okay. quite as prominent I think as I, I think we always make ever. it. Out. Yeah, really. Yeah, I think it did. I was like, oh, actually, now that, I've, now that I'm sitting down and really focusing on it. Yeah. I think a barren, deserted London holds a lot more weight to it. Mm. I think it's it's the empty streets. Yeah. And and, and like the, the invasion, I think, does that very yeah. well. But it's less so the Nazi allegory. But yeah, like, yeah. The, you know, obviously we've lived through seeing cities just completely empty. Yeah. I do think the end is a bit weird. Mm. And I don't think, I mean, the, the end of both this and the film don't yeah. really work. It's yeah. a bit of a cop out, you know, for, for this is like, oh, we've like s disabled all the Daleks in the world, all over the world. Yeah. And, and they, people have just risen up and destroyed them. Because they mentioned, obviously, yeah, like we said earlier, the Daleks yeah. have already conquered India. Would it be nice to maybe see that or how the Daleks even get disabled in the first place like I don't yes, quite understand that. Yes they do some that. weird thing don't they? David and Susan do it. At um, least it's a bit more physical in the movie yeah. where they they reverse the magnetic pole and yeah, that, 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 that is a bit that more. That works but, but even then you're like what, so it, what has every Dalek everywhere just gone yeah. like, in on itself? Exactly. Um, yeah. And what about anything else that's metal? What? Um, <laughs> you know, Only Dalekanian. Yeah we're like oh my belt buckle oh, oh, oh shit. Susan <laughs> okay. I'm being sucked down a hole. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, but you know, I digress. It's it's Doctor Who. It is know, Doctor logic Who. Logic is long gone out the window. Big time. Um, and then it's is it me? Am I the last yeah, one? Yeah, last one. Uh, yeah. Oh, fifth. Uh, Badger Man Badger says it's mostly potato, but there's a bit of meat in it. Which I yeah. I think is the best review possible. It is. It is. It is mostly potato, but there is a bit of meat in it. Across season two, where are we kind of ranking this? Um, there are better stories. Yeah. I prefer the chase. Yeah because I think it's just a bit more enjoyable to watch. Mm. Um, I, I mean, The Time Meddler is possibly my favorite William Hartnell story. Okay. So that's- That's so, only four parts, isn't it? That's so, only four parts. And yeah. I mean, it's just fantastic. You yeah. know, uh, Peter Butterworth is brilliant. Um, or what else is in that season? I mean, it's so it's so big, it's so massive. Yeah. The, the rescue, I like the rescue. The Romans is okay. Planet of um, Giants. Planet of Giants is all right. Um, web Planet is obviously the Web Planet. Um, 
Is there any? Is there anything? Crusade. Oh, the Crusade. I like the Crusade. Mm. Um, God, the Space Museum's not in this season, is it? Is it? It is, is it? It is in this season. Is that for the Crusade? Yeah. Oh, God, that old shite. I've got to watch that soon, have I? No, no. I'm well, not I will. Well, when, 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 when the box tech comes out. Comes out and I, like, I, I will say, I will give you a good two-year grace period before we have to touch <laughs> the Space Museum. Um, this is my favourite episode of, the favourite story of season two. Is it? And I think it's my favourite Dalek story of, of the William Hartnell era. Wow. Really? I really enjoyed Gosh. watching this. I mean, I, I, I love Master Plan. That is my favourite Hartnell Dalek story. I would suggest watching this across two days. That's what I did anyway. Yeah, we watched it over a few days. Um, and Master Plan, you know, you have to kind of settle in for that. Even, over even if few, you do over, split it. Over a couple of weeks. Over a couple of weeks. And yeah. for me, that's just a bit too much. Yeah. In, in the moment, at yeah. the time, I'm sure, yeah, I mean, must have been an absolute yeah, head spinner of a story. But looking back at it now, I just can't, unless I watch it one, one episode a week. Yeah. Which maybe we should do. Maybe we should like watch slash listen to an episode of, of Dalek's Master Plan and do a commentary for it each week. I can only imagine that's the way that we'll ever get to review Dalek's yeah. master plan for this. Oh, but do we have to talk about the Feast of Stephen? Because that's poo. Big time. Ugh. We have to dedicate an entire two-hour episode to the oh Feast of Stephen. Oh, my God. Oh, it's all full of Arabs. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and that is the best way possible to end this episode of the Review of Death. Uh, right, so next time, it's Christmas! Yeah. Uh, we are going to be talking about the Runaway Bride. We because, are. Because uh, David Tennant and Catherine Tate are in the air uh, at no, the moment. God knows why. Yeah, so uh, we thought, what better way to talk about Christmas and that uh, than talking about the Runaway Bride. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned for that next time. Um, that will be going out before Christmas Christmas. Christmas Christmas Day Day Day. Uh, so I shan't wish you a Merry Christmas yet. No. I'll do it next time. We'll do it so next time. For now, goodbye. Bye bye. <laughs>